And with that, Brian Merchant. Too. Thank you, Molly, for that. That was great. Thank you to Marissa and Ben and, and, and Eric here. Um, I'm quite glad to be here doing this debate on AI, uh, although I wonder if we're just going to do more emphatic agreeing than debating uh, in this nice session here. Um, but yes, Molly alluded to the f Oh, I have to talk into the mic. I can't wander freely. Uh, for like a free-range free journalist. Okay, fine. Um, instead, I'll sort of gaze out with intent concentration. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, so, yeah, Molly alluded to the fact that I am going to talk a little bit about the Luddites. Uh, it is the subject of my last book, Blood in the Machine, uh, that I started writing many, many years ago, long before the chat GPT and Dolly and Midjourney and all this sort of came to the front of the, of the conversation. So uh, let, me, let me put some folks on the spot here. Who, who knows what a Luddite is? Corey, put your hand down. You don't count. Uh, let, I'm going to pick on you right there. Can you? Yeah, what's a Luddite? No, no, no. It's all, I'm putting you on the spot. So most people uh, hear that term and say, it's somebody who doesn't like technology because they don't like progress. Uh, but it is somebody who resists the system that are being put in place to fucking replace them. And uh, I'm really glad you picked on me because I actually have an opening track on my last album called The Ballad of Ned Ludd. Yeah! yeah. After my own heart. It's Exactly. You know what? Actually, I don't need to give my talk anymore. I'm that, that, no, no, that's exactly right. And and I am uh, honestly, I'm so encouraged. That's, first of all, we're gonna let's talk afterwards. I want to hear you. I want to hear this uh, this music. Um, but yeah, usually when when I give this talk, people have these ideas about Luddite. It's you know somebody who doesn't doesn't get technology or like oh I can't you know I haven't gotten a new phone in five years or I want to throw my phone in the garbage because I you know I hate it. Um, it's, these re it's a reactionary, it's a, a reactionary, it's a technophobe, it's uh, someone who just can't get with the program. It's derogatory. And it is not, you know, it's not like that this term has been sort of magically misappropriated, which, which we'll talk about in, in some depth, um, but it's been intentionally misused from the day it was stamped on those cloth workers uh, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution who dared to sort of organize and stand up and say, we will not stand for having our labor degraded, de-skilled, and, and, and tossed out. We will not stand to see the factory system, in, I mean, for, for lack of a better word, uh, just let surrender our rights, our, our autonomy, our agency, so the Luddites, the first Luddites, uh, just for a, a quick historical background session, were they were cloth workers. They were cotton workers. They were uh, they were cloth finishers. They were framework knitters. Uh, they were part of the largest industrial base of workers in all of Lon of in all of England. Um, they were uh, apart from agricultural workers. They were the largest group of workers in England. So as the industrial revolution picks up steam and certain um, members of the entrepreneurial elite begin to use machinery in this new way to sort of organize labor and divide labor and adopt some new pieces of technology, some old pieces of technology, and use it uh, in opposition to those cloth workers, right? And that's the important point, because Molly's exactly right. The Luddites are a great example of why technology is not determined, because we have this point in history where things could have gone a number of different ways. And yet, these entrepreneurs and early tech titans, as I call them in my book, 
were able to amass the capital, the influence, and the power to build these enormous factories that were then put in opposition to the cloth workers who had for hundreds of years organized their lives in this way that they found agreeable, that they could work with their families, that they could sing songs, they could take breaks, they didn't have somebody breathing down their necks. And now these people, with the technology, with power, with the influence and the ability to start to transfer that work into the factory system uh, in the first decade, really, of, of the 1800s, uh, began this transformation as we know it today. And, 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 and why, is it, why does this matter? Why does this moment matter? Well, the reason that I went back to, to the Luddite example uh, 200 years ago is because long before ChatGPT, long before uh, Dolly, the writing was on the wall for the way that technology was going to be used to uh, disrupt structures uh, of work, to degrade workers. You, you only had to look at Uber and Lyft as Molly also pointed out, to, the, to what they were doing to not just the taxi industry, but to delivery workers, to, uh, to all kinds of, of, of precarious workers. Amazon, which was unleashing this brand new sort of technologically mediated regime where people at their warehouse were being forced to work like robots, to keep pace with robots. Uh, it, so it wasn't ChatGPT that, that inspired me to sort of to, to focus on the Luddite example, but it did rather quickly become maybe the most pronounced and most powerful example. Um, because what happened with the Luddites is after a decade of peaceably organizing, going to the government and saying, hey, look, these conditions are intolerable. We have these factory owners who are, they're not, they're not just changing the way that we work, they are undermining us, they're driving down wages, they're leaving us with a choice either to join the factory at a pittance and produce subpar work using these machines, very important. The machinery could not produce, just as it cannot today with, with creative uh, works, it could not produce work that was nearly on par with what was being produced by the skilled artisans, the skilled craftsmen. It was an inferior mass-produced alternative. Um, and so they had a choice abandon what was called the domestic system or the cottage industry. That's where that term comes from. The, the proto-Luddites, the pre-Luddites were part of the cottage industry and get on board with the, this factory system. They organized, they said, at least give us a minimum wage so we can feed our families because by the end of that decade, by 1810 or so, you literally have uh, cloth workers who can no longer afford to feed their families. They're starving. Um, they, they protest and they appeal to the industrialists, the tech titans of their day. They hear nothing, they get nothing. Uh, and finally, when there's a, a big economic downturn and their, 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 uh, their quality of life collapses further and then the uh, entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial elite move in with even more machines to try to automate even further, They've got their backs against the wall, and they finally rise up. And in 1811, they become the Luddites. And they do what they're famous for, which is, yes, taking a hammer and smashing the machines that are being used to take their jobs. And once again, let me underline, and this is something that, uh, that Corey has pointed out too, if those very same industrialists had come along with this technology and said, you guys have been doing this for 200 years, Let's, do, let's work together so we can make all of our lives better. You can figure out how to get the quality up. We can work. We can maybe participate in, 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 in a technological revolution together. Man, can you imagine how different it would be today? Instead, they said, no, we are going to take this technology. We're going to sit at the top of these new pyramids that we're erecting. We're going to siphon all the profits up to the top. And we're going to pay our workers even less. And that was what the Luddites were protesting just as much. So in 1811, they take up their hammers, they start their write letter writing campaign where they write a letter to a local factory owner and say, dear sir, we know that you have 800 or 400 or 300 of the obnoxious machines on your premises. If you do not take them down, you will get a visit from General Ludd or Ned Ludd's army. If they took them down, fine. The social contract was restored, and all would be OK. If they did not take them down, then they would make good on their word, and they would show up under the cover of night, or eventually in broad daylight, hold up the overseer at gunpoint, or sneak in through the windows, and use those hammers to smash the machines en masse. And only the machines 
that were tearing up that social contract. All the machines that had been used for years before, they would let stand. Uh, and then they would leave with a threat, usually. If you, put, if you bring back the machines, you try this again, we will return and we'll do the whole place. So for a while, this movement was extremely successful. Uh, it was popular. Folk songs were written about them. They were cheered in the streets. People, the, for a while, the, the officials that were supposed to be keeping the peace would just watch on in, in, in sort of tacit approval of these, uh, these actions because it was not just the Luddites or the cloth workers. It was all of the, the working class that, uh, at the time that was not yet constituted as a working class. In fact, historians sort of, some historians credit the Luddites as being a catalyzing factor in getting the working class to recognize these solidarities they had with each other because they saw that not just the machines, but factorization and this mode of work would lead to a grimmer and duller future for everyone. So they fought back. And eventually, we can talk more about the details later, they were crushed by the state. One thing you'll hear sometimes is like, oh, well, their mode of, of living was just sort of like outvoted by consumers because who got cheaper stuff? No, no, no. It was crushed with, a, uh, with, with an occupation that was larger than any that Britain had ever seen. Tens of thousands of troops mobilized into the industrial districts to put them down, to put down the Luddite rebellion. It was made a crime punishable by death to smash a machine uh, by the parliament of the time. Fun side note, uh, probably the most famous opponent of that move uh, was one Lord Byron who gave his maiden speech in the, in the House of Lords defending the Luddites. It's probably the most famous sort of pro-Luddite, uh, contemporaneous pro-Luddite pro uh, speech uh, ever given. Um, but they're crushed. Luddites are hung and the propaganda machine of the state moves into full swing and the Luddites are stamped with this, uh, this, this mischaracterization that persists today, right? These, though they're backwards looking, look, they lost. Why would you want to, you know, hit your wagon to that train? Uh, they, yeah, this is what happens when you protest technology. You get crushed. Um, and, wh and why does that matter? Because nothing has really changed in the general mode that technology is deployed and developed in mass, especially with regards to how it affects the workforce. For the last 200 years, so I wrote, I wrote this book in search of a parallel what I found was a constant. It ebbs and it flows, but you can look back to automation through the industrialization of the, uh, of, of like the auto manufacturing uh, industry, for example. And before that, you, there's, there's the, 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 you, can, you can look at you know, computerization in the 90s. There was a neo-Luddite resurgence for precisely this reason. So over and over again, you see a top-down pushing or foisting of a technology onto a working people who then have to react to it. Today, we are, fine, we are seeing, yet again, the same thing take place, right? Who in this room asked for generative AI and wanted it and said, hey, you know, we all, you know what would make our life better? A, a, a system that would, uh, that, that would pilfer the creative works of every human ever and then, uh, and then churn out this sort of, uh, this, this grim, uh, mush that you can then use for your corporate PowerPoint. Nobody. And the threat is very real. And more so than the examples, many of the examples that I included in the book, the Luddites were fighting uh, to preserve the cloth making industry and they took great pride in the cloth that they produced. Uh, today, generative AI threatens no less than every mode of creative labor that you can imagine. And the threat is real. It is real. I want to make sure, as Molly did a great job of, of demonstrating, that we're talking about this not in the abstract terms, but as something that is happening now. So as a journalist today, just about every week, I talk with a new artist, illustrator, copywriter, even coder, somebody who is seeing what's happening right now. And that is they're losing work as an illustrator to corporate clients that can now use Midjourney. They are seeing their colleagues being fired in game development because the designers can now use uh, Dolly. And this is explicitly happening. Some of these firings that are being sort of obscured away as to, uh, uh, along with greater trends in the, in the tech industry are, as a, uh, are due to automation. They're, it's happening right now. It is degrading conditions 
degrading the quality of life. And fortunately, there are people like Molly who are resisting. So I will leave it there, and I look forward to discussing the Luddites and uh, how all of you can become one. <laughs> now. Thank <laughs> you.